Well, thank you, Peter. Thanks for all the work you did organizing this, and thanks especially for assembling such a wonderful group for this panel. It makes my job very easy. Um, I think I'm going to do the introductions first, just so you know the participants. Uh, on my right, both physically and ideologically, um, my colleague Marcus Cole, the William Benjamin Scott and Luna M. Scott Professor of Law here at Stanford. Marcus practiced bankruptcy and commercial law at Mayor Brown and Platt in Chicago before coming into academics, and among other things, has been a national fellow at the Hoover Institution. Um, and to my left, and immediate left, physically anyway, uh, George Triantis, the Eli Goldston Professor of Law at the Harvard Law School. George also has taught at the University of Chicago and University of Virginia Law Schools. And I'm particularly proud to add that he got his JSD at this law school, Stanford. He's one of ours. Um, and then last in this list, but not at all least, Adam Leviton, uh, professor at Georgetown University Law Center, previously practiced at uh, Wild Gottschall. And among his other accomplishments, has been a scholar in residency at the American, scholar in residence at the American Bankruptcy Institute. Anyway, all three of them are going to talk about the actual bankruptcy process as applied to states, for and against, whether it should be, how it might work. We decided to go in alphabetical order, so Marcus, you can take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dick. Um, since we, uh, we only have uh, 10 minutes or so for uh, each of our presentations, I thought that the, uh, the most efficient use of my time would be uh, to tell you a joke. <laughs> so uh, a Catholic priest is working late one night, and uh, he's exhausted. It's close to midnight, and he decides to go for a walk. And he starts walking along and comes upon a bridge, and he finds a guy standing on the railing of the bridge. And he imagines that the guy's about to jump, so he runs up to him and says, my son, my son, you can't do this. You can't, you can't end your life this way. And the guy turns to the priest and says, Father, you just don't understand. I've lost everything. I've lost my home. My wife left me. Uh, I can't even afford to keep my dog anymore. Uh, and the priest says, well, I'm so exhausted. I can't tell you what would solve your problem. But I have this Bible here. Please take it. And I'm sure that you'll find the answer to whatever problem you have in its pages. It's always helped me. And I'm sure it'll help you. And the guy said, well, Father, I don't think it's going to help. And the priest said, please, please, just try it. So the guy takes the Bible and goes away. And then a couple weeks later, the priest is again working late and decides again to go for another walk. And he happens upon the same bridge. And lo and behold, there's the same guy standing on the bridge with a, a smile on his face. And the priest walks up to him and says, oh, what happened? You were, you were about to kill yourself a few weeks ago. And now, all of a sudden, you're, you're really cheerful. He says, Father, I've been waiting here for you for nights. Um, I'm so glad I found you. You gave me this book, and the answer to all my prayers were right here in this book. And the priest says, well, I know that the book has a lot of wisdom in it, but I can't imagine that you found something that solved all those problems so quickly. He said, yeah, Father, I opened it up, and the answer was staring me right there on the page. And the priest said, well, um, I, I'm really curious to find out what, what could have been on the page of, of the Bible that could have solved all these problems. He said, Father, I opened it up, and it was right there. I opened it up to this page right here, and it said, Chapter 11. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I think that that joke by the way, it's the only bankruptcy joke I know. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, that joke tells, I think, everything about uh, the, the problem that we're confronting. It's that uh, people think of bankruptcy as a miraculous solution uh, to every problem that we encounter. And unfortunately, uh, I'm here to say that it, it simply isn't. And it's particularly a bad solution uh, when it comes um, uh, to state insolvency. So. Uh, what I want to do is first talk a little bit about the problem of uh, state insolvency and what we're uh, encountering and why bankruptcy is uh, not a miraculous solution to it. And then uh, uh, second, talk about the particulars of uh, bankruptcy law and why uh, neither Chapter 9 nor any other modification of other aspects of the bankruptcy code uh, is likely to solve uh, this um, 
problem. And then finally, I just want to uh, throw out some suggestions of, of what alternatives um, might work uh, instead. Um, so I think uh, that some of the questions from the last session, uh, particularly uh, uh, Michael McConnell's question, uh, pointed out uh, uh, some of the common roots of uh, state insolvency that we're witnessing. Greece, Portugal, Ireland, uh, and now California uh, and Illinois have uh, several things in common. Right, and uh, uh, Professor McConnell um, uh, mentioned them in his question. They're they all uh, states uh, that uh, have uh, some control over their uh, fiscal policy, but uh, absolutely no control over uh, their monetary policy. It's not true that they have absolutely no control over the monetary policy, but they have only indirect influence on their uh, monetary policy. They don't have uh, central banks. They don't print uh, their uh, own money. But there are other similarities as well. Um, California, Illinois, Greece, and uh, Portugal, Ireland have all uh, established uh, very extensive uh, and burdensome uh, social uh, 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 redistribution schemes, um, very large, uh, some would even argue bloated uh, public sectors, uh, and pension regime, uh, regimes. Um, uh, uh, as well as uh, structural social welfare spending mandates that tend uh, to undermine not just their current reserves, but also their ability to create uh, wealth in, in the short term uh, as well as the long term. Uh, and the political uh, um, incentive structure is bad. Um, we didn't hear uh, as much focus on this earlier as I expected, but uh, the fact of the matter is we have politicians who are term limited and in office today making promises about uh, pensions and other, and other things uh, in the future when they're going to be long uh, out of office. And um, uh, they, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is an argument against term limits, but it is an argument that uh, their incentive structure is, um, is, uh, is twisted, uh, to say the least. California uh, is, however, no Greece or Portugal. Uh, 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 Professor Rodden uh, stole my statistic. I looked at the, uh, um, the market for credit default swaps uh, just this morning, and uh, California is listed in the top 10 of the states most likely to default uh, uh, according to um, the market for credit default swaps. Um, but that ranks it ahead of places like uh, Portugal, uh, which uh, is, uh, is strange, uh, to say the least, or might say something about the likelihood of, uh, or what the markets believe is the likelihood of a bailout. Uh, California is also not in the same uh, state as, uh, as Greece or uh, Portugal. Uh, Greece has a debt uh, to GDP ratio of 1.45 as of last week. Uh, or in other words, 145% of uh, its GDP is, uh, is debt. 121% for uh, Portugal, whereas uh, California is, is uh, hovering in the 90s. Uh, and uh, as of last week, it was uh, at 90% of um, uh, GDP. But that doesn't include its, uh, its unfunded share of Medicare and Medicaid uh, uh, liabilities, which could put it as high uh, as 400%. Uh, 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 now, can bankruptcy solve this, this uh, problem? Um, bankruptcy is not designed to solve a problem like this. Uh, bankruptcy is, uh, is a solution that's imposed uh, ex ante so that all the players coming into a relationship know what the outcome of the relationship will be if things go bad. Uh, this, these relationships, these debt relationships, these ob obligations have already been incurred. Now, I can understand uh, Professor Steele's um, uh, position on the benefits of, of introducing a bankruptcy-like regime to handle these uh, obligations, because after all, he's a historian. And we've done this kind of thing with bankruptcy uh, in the past. We've, uh, we've used bankruptcy to solve uh, crises, uh, uh, financial crises after the Civil War, for example, um, to, to solve uh, the, the debt crisis in the South. Uh, and uh, when we've had bank runs uh, in uh, the 19th century. But the fact of the matter is we've never had a situation quite like this, because we've never used bankruptcy as 
an exclusive solution to the problem of insolvency. Bankruptcy has always stood as an alternative uh, to other solutions uh, 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 for uh, insolvency. So for example, if we look at uh, chapter nine uh, uh, for uh, municipal bankruptcies, um, uh, part of what chapter nine tries to do is uh, to replicate uh, what we have for corporations under chapter 11. But the situation isn't the same with respect to political entities. In chapter 11, one of the things we do is we try to make sure that all of the creditors are treated fairly by having various tests before we go forward with a plan. So one, one of the tests is what we call a best interest of the creditors test. If we liquidate all of the corporation's assets, are we going to be uh, treating this uh, uh, creditor under our plan of reorganization as well as we would have treated them had the assets been liquidated. We don't have anything like that under uh, chapter, chapter 9. Chapter 9 doesn't incorporate a best interest of the creditors test for a good reason. Right? You can't imagine um, liquidating the state capitol building. Where are we going to turn it into a shopping mall or something like that, right? With a hotel at one end. We'll use the Senate chambers as a hotel uh, wing and shops on the other and we don't know what would happen with the liquidation of uh, state assets, and so we can't treat uh, uh, states uh, uh, the same way. Um, uh, the, the thing that makes uh, bankruptcy work uh, is the, uh, the market discipline, the market pressure that the alternatives to bankruptcy uh, create, the ability to go to um, uh, uh, foreclosure markets or, uh, 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 I'm sorry, foreclosure, foreclosure proceedings uh, or other alternatives to bankruptcy uh, as a backdrop against which uh, um, we would set uh, the process. What might work instead of um, uh, bankruptcy for these states? Well, um, part of the problem is uh, the, the uh, lack of uh, political discipline in places like Greece or California, where voters, if you look at um, polls of voters in California, voters in California want more services and less taxes. Right? They want more toppings on the pizza, but <laughs> they want the pizza for free. Um, and uh, that's uh, simply an irresponsible stance and uh, can't go on um, uh, forever. Um, Bankruptcy can't solve that problem. What can solve that problem? Now, I'm no fan. I, you know, I, I share uh, a lot of uh, Professor Rodden's position with respect to um, uh, uh, my uh, concern about uh, central government imposing a solution. But if you look at the solution that's been imposed on uh, Greece or Ireland, uh, what's, what's happened is that in exchange for the bailouts, uh, austerity measures were imposed on uh, the people of those states. And in other words, uh, the people in, of those states are now being forced to, to take responsibility for their prior uh, position with respect to taxing and spending. They're taking responsibility for the, the uh, uh, decisions of their um, um, elected officials. It, uh, bankruptcy cannot solve the political problem, but it also cannot be argued that bankruptcy isn't a political process. So if we try, even if we try to impose a bankruptcy solution on the states, you have to recognize that a bailout or a bankruptcy is going to look uh, uh, very similar. Right? We're, we're the, the bailout of California or the bankruptcy of California is gonna look a lot like the bankruptcy of Chrysler which no one could possibly argue was apolitical. Right, so, uh, and, and if you want to make that argument, um, I know uh, I have the phone numbers of several um, Chrysler bondholders who would love to hear you uh, make uh, the argument that the, the Chrysler uh, um, uh, bankruptcy was apolitical. So uh, bankruptcy can't solve uh, the crisis because the crisis in California as well as Greece is uh, really a, a political one and not uh, uh, merely uh, fiscal. Bankruptcy is magic, and like magic, it doesn't really exist for a problem uh, like this. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, and sadly, only a solution that punishes uh, individual Californians and ind uh, individual Greeks uh, 
for political uh, irresponsibility, uh, like the austerity measures imposed by the EU uh, on Greece, um, uh, is likely to force uh, Californians and um, uh, their political institutions to, to, to um, address uh, the fiscal problem. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker is Professor Adam Levitin from Georgetown. So I teach in Bailout City, and <laughs> what uh, there's something interesting about the founding of Bailout City. So here's here's a we have a nice statue of the founder of Bailout City right in front of the U.S. Treasury Department, and it's a little hard to see him there. Maybe you could you recognize him from his portrait in the National Gallery, or maybe he's in your wallet on the ten dollar bill. So what do, what, do, what do I mean when I talk about Alexander Hamilton as the founder of Washington, D.C.? Well, here was the problem. These guys, so, you know, this, this is sort of our, er, uh, sort of our original version of the, of the Navy SEALs here, right? That uh, we, 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 have, we have these wonderful patriots, but there's a little problem with them. They're not just fighting out of, you know, warm feelings for, for, uh, for, for, for their country. They also want to be paid, and they want pensions. And they're state employees. They're not federal employees, most of them. They're state employees. And they're coming looking for their pensions. And so after the Revolutionary War, we have, a, we have our first state budget crisis, where the states are straddled with huge debts and not a lot of ability to repay them. And this, you know, this, this should sound a little familiar. So what was the solution? Well, Hamil Alan, this Alexander Hamilton's solution was uh, to propose having the federal government assume state uh, debts. This was not a new idea. Robert Morris, uh, sort of the patron saint of bankruptcy among the founders, had uh, proposed this solution 10 years before, but it hadn't taken off. And there was a reason for it. There was a political problem. That some states were, uh, had been uh, more responsible than others after the Revolutionary War in paying down their debts, particularly uh, Maryland and Virginia. And uh, let's see, oops, better. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but uh, if you look at this, the, uh, I'm using state population as a rough proxy for colonial GDP, figuring that in colonial times, no one was really that much more productive than anyone else. Um, and uh, then I have a percentage, percentage of, uh, of, the, of the total debt broken down by states. And you can see that some states, namely Virginia and Maryland, are uh, sort of uh, have a very different ratio than, let's say, uh, Massachusetts and South Carolina. So Virginia and Maryland had been rather responsible. Virginia had sold Kentucky several times to pay down its debts. Uh, Maryland had debased its currency, and they had both raised taxes. OK, so they, they've, been, they've been acting responsibly, and they don't like the idea of the federal government assuming the debts, the state debts, because they say, wait, this isn't such a good deal for us relative to Massachusetts or South Carolina. And the, in order to get their, their assent to the debt assumption deal, Hamilton has to offer them something. And what he offers them is the, the nation's capital. And he says, well, you know, well, we, we, have, we haven't figured out where we're going to have the capital yet. It's been in New York as a de facto arrangement. We'll move it to a swamp, malarial swamp on the Maryland-Delaware, uh, Maryland-Virginia uh, border. And that's now home. OK, so notice here. That what's going on is that we that Hamilton is using a bailout to solve a political problem, not an economic one. That federal assumption of state debt doesn't change the debt burden. The federal government doesn't have any particular greater um, earnings power, especially in colonial times, than the, than the states. But we have a we have a state budget problem, and the solution is a political one. <coughs> and this is nothing new. The, having say state budget problems. And historically, we've resolved them without bankruptcy. So the question is, what are we hoping that bankruptcy is going to accomplish? And I think it's important to remember, bankruptcy is a means to an end, <laughs> even though sometimes it means the end. Uh, and we have to figure out what is the problem we're trying to solve. So we've got, you know, traditionally we've got, I think more, we can probably boil it down to about three rad general rationales for bankruptcy. And D David Skill really spoke about the first two. That we have a collective action problem um, with a race to the courthouse for a limited pool, uh, common pool of assets. We have a debt overhang problem. And then we have a, a concern about preservation of going concern value 
um, with illiquid firms. Uh, and, uh, Marcus alluded to that, where you know it, we have uh, this essentially goes to the best interest test. The problem is that none of these rationales fit very well for U.S. states. The uh, asset pool really is not so limited with U.S. states. They have, uh, unlike municipalities, they have unlimited taxing authority. I mean, it's possible that they go over the top of the Laffer curve at some point, but that, that seems unlikely, um, at least currently. Uh, they have the ability to cut services. A, f a firm can't stop operating or it's out of business. A state can stop paving roads and it, you know, it's still a state. We don't really have, we don't have the race to the courthouse problem that we have with, um, with, with firms. We have uh, the debt overhang problem gets mitigated because of state taxing authority and particularly because of revenue bonds. That's basically a structured finance solution uh, for, uh, for states where they can say, uh, this particular uh, tax stream is going to be dedicated to, um, to paying off this particular set of bonds. And then, uh, as, as Marcus said, you know, states don't really have any going concern value. There's no liquidation value to California. You, you, can't, you can't contemplate that. So I, I, it's important to think, remember, that the, the real problem with states is a political one, not an economic one. And this is because that there's a lack of political discipline on state budgets. It's that they want, as Marcus said, they want all the pizza toppings and they want them for free. And this suggests that we need a political solution to the problem. And is bankruptcy a good tool for that? And you know, I think the answer is clearly not. But I, before we, we, we think about j just what bankruptcy can do, it's important to think about wh exactly what drives the, um, the, pro the political problem with, with state budgets. And I think it's really um, a, reward, a risk reward imbalance. So imagine two scenarios. So, so your state legislators, uh, legislators are the people who are setting the budgets. Scenario number one is that you, 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 you spend big and the state manages to meet its budget. And that's great because now there's a patronage surplus. You can you know, give lots of jobs to people in your district and you're popular and you get reelected unless there's a term limit. Alternatively, you spend big and you miss the budget and you're still likely reelected. So you know, lots of state legislators are from rotten boroughs. Their elections are binary, involve binary choices where, uh, between candidates but lots and lots of issues. You know, this guy's great on the budget but he's terrible on social issues. Um, that elections are, are not, you know, to sta they're staggered and they're also not timely. And then you've got, you know, uh, lots and lots of people who can be blamed. It's not just, it's not that any one legislator is responsible for a budget crisis. And on top of that, there's always the, you know, the gamble that, well, I mean, you know, maybe if, if it goes badly, the, fed, the feds will bail us out. Well, what can bankruptcy do with this? I think one, there's a, a good, there's a good argument in the, for bankruptcy and then there's a not good argument for bankruptcy. The good argument is bankruptcy could be a type of uh, what Richard Epstein terms second order rationality. And this, uh, that is a way of letting lawmakers tie their hands because they know they don't have the political willpower to make good decisions. Alternatively though, bankruptcy could just be used as a partisan tool for um, giving judicial cover for a particular factional agenda. And I fear that it's much more likely to be used as the latter than the former, but I can't say with certainty what, what it would actually be used for. Uh, what I can say, though, is I don't think it's likely to really be a very good fix to the political problem. That, we're trying, uh, that uh, bankruptcy offers at most a, a financial legal solution. Why, why would we think this would fix a political problem? Long term, it's very unlikely to do so. At best, it's a one-time fix for an immediate problem. It doesn't sort of, uh, it really cannot bind Ulysses to the mass in terms of uh, second order rash, uh, rationality where it states function, really truly tie their hands. And if, uh, the, the real concern here is that you would have serial filing. And uh, we need to just look at the sovereign debt world where we can see you know, serial defaults by Argentina, let's say. So it's not hard to, to imagine California becoming the new Argentina in terms of serial defaults. You could, if we had had state bankruptcy, we could have had California defaults in the uh, bankruptcy in the 80s, in the 90s, and the 2000s. And incidentally, when you look at municipal bankruptcy filings, we have a bunch of serial filers. It's, uh, that uh, that, so it's not, you know, this is not a theoretical problem. Uh, now, most state bankruptcy proposals look at Chapter 9 as a model. And I have to say that it's really just an untenable model for much of anything. I think rather than expanding Chapter 9, we, we should really be thinking about whether you know, there, there's any reason to have it in the first place. Um, 
just want to show you who's filing for chapter nine. Now these don't look like they're showing up real well. Okay, so this is chapter nine filings uh, by year. And we have a huge uh, number of them of, uh, of when chapter nine, that's Roman numeral nine, is originally enacted. And then it drops down to you know, less than 20 a year. But don't think that these are municipalities. If you look at chapter nine filings since 1980, what you see is that the, uh, well, basically we've had, uh, if you look at it in the PACER system, the court record system, almost 20% almost of them have been erroneous filings. That, you know, it's John Smith filing for chapter nine instead of for chapter seven or 13. <laughs> Okay, then, so we're you know, put putting the erroneous filings aside. We have, you know, the, the overwhelming majority are either uh, sanitary or water districts or uh, hospital districts. And then there's some things they couldn't categorize, like New York City off-track betting. Uh, doesn't really say, you know, that looks a lot more like a firm than it looks like a state. Uh, we do have, though, 41 municipalities and counties. Um, that's actually kind of overcounting because six of those are repeat filings. And then when you look at what those uh, cities and counties look like, they're really rinky-dink. Um, I mean, that the, the, uh, the median population from the preceding census puts them at like 1,300 uh, 1, people is the median population. Now, there are some, a few exceptions. We have Orange County. We have Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, we have Camden, New Jersey. But most of them are very, very small. And just to give you a flavor of what some of these are, uh, we have Moffat, Oklahoma, where the, the, there was an, uh, the town, most of the town's revenue came from an illegal speed trap <laughs> that was shut down. <laughs> then, uh, okay, we got Marshall Creek, where they had, uh, basically they lost a, a contract to police a park to another town. And then, um, my, and then the, the very sad case of, of uh, Washington Park, Illinois. It's basically an East St. Louis suburb. And uh, this is their second filing. And both times the filings got kicked out because they don't have authority to actually file. Um, but they, they, uh, they lost, they, their town's major revenue source was from strip clubs, uh, the licensing fees. And they, they, the licensing fee system was ruled unconstitutional. Then they also, you know, $400,000 embezzled by employees. And then, you know, during, like, during the bankruptcy, the mayor guy was murdered. So very unhappy town. Uh, when, you look at the, when you look at municipal <coughs> bankruptcy filings, they look, the, the actual filings look like consumer bankruptcy filings. They file schedules of assets that list individual cars, usually the Chevy Impala police cruiser and the fire engine and the, you know, the, uh, the, shot, the Remington shotgun owned by the police. They actually schedule these out. Um, Lehman Brothers did not schedule things like that. So, you know, it's hard, it's hard to think of Chapter 9 as being a model really for anything. On top of this, you know, it's not even clear that, we, that, that states need bankruptcy. That um, we actually seem to see a fair amount, um, uh, the mar market discipline may be working. That, uh, so when states are profligate, their borrowing costs go up and states have to react. And we have some states that have raised taxes, others that have cut services, and then uh, to the extent that you think collective bargaining agreements are a problem, they're getting renegotiated. So we may not even need this tool. Uh, states have pretty good leverage without bankruptcy. On top of this, you could argue that electoral discipline actually does work when things get bad enough. And you know, maybe an interpretation of the last election was, uh, uh, was that there was some discipline on budgets. OK, so very quickly, the last point here is how do we fix this? Um, I think, you know, Marcus, I think, expressed an important point, saying that you know, there, there's some discomfort with the federal government telling the states what to do. And we're, you know, as a generic matter, I think that that's quite reasonable. But I think that changes if we can show that there are externalities on other states. And I think that actually there are some pretty clear externalities from state political dysfunction. Uh, that when it affects state budgets, that can have, so if, uh, if California defaulted on its bonds, that would, ha that would uh, potentially create panic effects also in the municipal bond market. You also have bond insurers and financial intermediaries that are tied together. So lots of, lots of states have their bonds insured by a handful of monoline insurers. Think of like an AIG kind of entity. Uh, if California defaults and MBIA gets wiped out as a result, that's going to hurt the credit rating of uh, Illinois' bonds. We then have, um, so, you know, have cross-subsidization that exists through, uh, through federal welfare programs. 
and then also through actually the, uh, the, the housing finance system, through the GSEs. The GSEs do not, uh, do not price based on locality. Uh, they should, but they don't uh, as a political matter. So we, ha we, ha we end up having uh, states, you know, fiscal problems in one state do affect other states, and that, that speaks to a need for finding some, uh, some way of dealing with the problem on the federal level. Also, as Damon mentioned on the, on the first panel, we have uh, you know, this whole link system of federal state transfer payments that you know, the federal government is intimately linked and arguably part of the problem. So what to do about this? I think there are two, uh, two, kind of two basic routes we can go. And I'm, um, I'm going to reserve, you know, maybe for later, uh, opinions on what's the better route. Um, route one is to do this ad hoc. And we can do this through bailouts or, if, you know, one man's bailout is the other man's transfer payment. Um, it's just what you think is kind of normal course of business. And so we can, do the, we can do this through ad hoc bailouts. And that allows for a very flexible, bespoke response. You know, the constitutional authority for the federal government bailing out states is really unclear. Uh, and it's a hard sell politically, but that's at least one option. The other option is trying to develop some kind of a standing political discipline me mechanism. And I think probably the leading candidate for that is having a federal requirement of state balance budgets. So states have their own balance budget. Every state except Vermont has some kind of a balance budget requirement. But they don't really have enforcement mechanisms that are very good. So we could come up with a federal requirement for state balanced budgets and have an enforcement mechanism. And you can contrast that with the EU's Maastricht Treaty, which has a balanced budget requirement and no enforcement mechanism because of sovereignty. One, you know, you can imagine, a, you can imagine an enforcement mechanism that would essentially be something like a conservatorship or in the um, municipal context what we do is financial control boards. The problem with that is that it just ends up recreating bankruptcy. Because if you have a receivership, there are priorities as to who the receiver is going to pay, in what order, what expenses are going to be cut, in what order, and that just is a recreation of a bankruptcy system. And ultimately, we kind of end up with, you know, the ultimate outcome of all of this is either there are going to be losses that have to be spread, and we need a system that allocates those losses, and we can call that bankruptcy, we can call it something else, but we have a loss spreading system, or we have a system which somehow avoids losses. And I don't think that second system really exists. Having a federal bailout is not an avoidance of losses, it's just a socialization of losses. So this speaks to, to, coming, to coming up with a distributional system for losses. And I would just, um, the only comment I have on that is it's much better when we do that behind a Rawlsian veil when we don't know whose ox is going to be gored and whose ox is going to be fattened. When we start trying to do it, when we start doing it, um, coming up with distributional schemes that where it's very clear, you know, the unions are gonna, are, are gonna get it in the head on this one or the municipal bond creditors are, that's not, systems like that suffer in, in terms of legitimacy. And, we do, and when bankruptcy is, uh, does its best is when it's uh, in the abstract. The special interest provisions of the bankruptcy code, and there are all kinds of them, are the ones that really chip away at you know at, at bankruptcy as a as a good structure. So with that, I will leave you with one last slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our last panelist is George Triantes from Harvard. Thank you. Um, David Skeel, I think, has done a tremendous service by um, giving some intellectual rigor to the pr proposal by, chiefly by Repu some Republicans, uh, that there be a federal level uh, state bankruptcy regime. Um, and it looks like the three of us are ganging up on him in his <laughs> absence. But actually, I think that I can uh, frame my remarks as being somewhere in between the two. And, and I will entitle this as bankruptcy for the states and by the states. So it relates really to the third objective that uh, David Skeel mentioned in his introductory remarks. And that is, it's an argument if bankruptcy makes sense, then why not have the states themselves enact some, maybe we won't call it bankruptcy, some restructuring uh, mechanism. You'll notice that uh, uh, David, in uh, perhaps in a moment of candor, he said uh, that uh, bankruptcy may make sense in, under conditions of extreme, almost catastrophic uh, 
type of conditions. And he's pretty clear that we're not in those sort of conditions right now. And that's also the scenario that I want to address. Not the way things are, not the financial conditions in 2011, uh, but uh, conditions that would occur uh, under or as a result of catastrophic and also important to me would be unforeseen uh, 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 contingency. Um, both, uh, well, especially Adam, but both Adam and Marcus, I think, made an important point, and that is that bankruptcy cannot be used for municipalities or states in order to collect, uh, correct political problems, in order to correct governance problems, in order to restructure the economic activity of states or municipalities. And therefore, the uh, economic rationale for bankruptcy would be, as Adam said, an insurance policy for uh, states or to correct this uh, debt overhang problem. But I think he dismissed these a little too quickly. Uh, debt overhang is not corrected simply because states or municipalities have taxing authority. Overhang means not that you can't, in the corporate sector, it doesn't mean that there isn't capital out there, but no one's going to give you the capital. Taxing can, uh, invokes the coercive uh, power of the state, but people also have the ability to move, to leave the state. Uh, moreover, you use Greece as an example, and uh, you don't have to be of Greek heritage like I am to know that what happens when you raise taxes in Greece is that people will cheat more. They will evade taxes more, and it's not clear that you're going to be able to raise more money simply by raising uh, taxes. So the cheating, the bribing, the corruption, and the exit of economic activity are all instances of uh, debt overhang, or the problem of debt overhang in the case of the state. And so it may make sense to have a restructuring policy in order to provide insurance, uh, which I think makes some sense. I can talk about it a little bit in the, uh, uh, in the discussion afterwards. But it makes sense to have it also to address the overhang problem the way that I've described it. Moreover, the creditors themselves may benefit from the correction of the debt overhang. Uh, if economic activity leaves the jurisdiction, the creditors may have great difficulty getting paid. Although the states uh, pledge their uh, faith and credit to the repayment of indebtedness, it's much harder to obtain a remedy against a reluctant state officials than it is against an individual or a corporation. And I, this is an important point that I'll return to uh, in a moment. So there may be some room for some mechanism involving some combination of renegotiation of debt and judicial oversight as well to restructure and relieve the debt burden on the states that are in unforeseen and dire straits. Now the question is, why does it need to be a federal uh, uh, regime? Why can't it be a state regime? And there are lots of reasons why it might be a state regime. Already the code provides for municipalities that even though it's a federal regime, a municipality cannot file for bankruptcy under Chapter uh, 9 unless it has the authorization of the state. And therefore, necessarily, for constitutional reasons, even if there were a federal bankruptcy regime, it could only be triggered by a state if, under a voluntary filing by the state. And states seem reluctant to invite a bankruptcy process. This is clear from the historical experience where states have not authorized other than uh, things like sanitary districts and water districts and, and uh, uh, special purpose uh, corporations, generally they haven't authorized a lot of municipal general municipalities to file. And the ones that have filed have been, as Adam showed, small. And also they are ones that have uh, 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 meet with financial difficulty because of idiosyncratic and unforeseen shocks. To the, addition, to the examples that Adam mentioned, of course, there are renegade derivatives traders in the treasury of, of, some of uh, one of these uh, municipalities, or, and in several of them, there are large lawsuits that lead them to file. It's also clear that when the uh, proposal was made earlier this year by, by several uh, um, members of the Republican Party, that state officials were opposed and they testified uh, in front of a con congressional committees against a bankruptcy for states, okay? They may feel different about the alternative of bankruptcy for the states and by the states. And I should mention that it has a clear analog in the scholarly literature on corporate bankruptcy, and that is several authors have suggested that you might leave it to the corporation itself, to the corporate debtor itself, to choose its bankruptcy mechanism and put it in the charter of incorporation, 
or the, or the state could provide a menu and let the corporations decide what type of a bankruptcy regime it might like. The benefit is you avoid the one-size-fits-all regime, and even though there's significant flexibility in the code, that might be an advantage. And also, you could avoid the biases that result from a political process that creates a bankruptcy regime. The uh, states, and uh, this is to get to Jonathan Rodden's point earlier, the states would be, dis sorry, the corporations would be disciplined in their choice of a bankruptcy regime by the market. The market would price in, the, in their debt the, uh, uh, the bankruptcy regime that they chose in the charter. And the same thing would happen with the states. If the states chose it themselves, it, they would be subject to market discipline. The better your bankruptcy regime for the creditors, uh, the better your cost of capital. So you would internalize, thank you, any uh, cost or benefit from your regime. Moreover, you can draw another analogy to the race to the top. Uh, 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 argument about state uh, corporate laws, you could say that the states would race to the top in designing the appropriate restructuring uh, for their own uh, debt in the case of some financial distress. So as I said, the easy case is that uh, uh, I think for or the easiest case, as David Skeel mentioned, would be an unforeseen catastrophic event that causes financial distress. The more tricky question is uh, the constitutional question whether uh, states would be constitutionally permitted to enact such a statute and, uh, or put it in their constitution. But let's just look at a statute. Um, and uh, I'll look at, there are a handful of constitutional impediments, but in the interest of time, let me look at two uh, and do them inadequately, I'm sure. The one is the contracts clause in the federal constitution, and the second one is the requirement in state constitutions as well as state statutes that the state pledge its faith and credit to the repayment of the state's debt. Okay, so first the contracts clause. States, unlike the federal Congress, is, are restricted by the contracts clause in, which prohibits them from impairing the obligation of contracts. And there's a good deal of case law concerning the contracts clause, but I want to mention two of the leading cases in the modern era and uh, briefly go through the implications for a bankruptcy regime for the states and by the states. The first is U.S. Trust Company of New York versus State of New Jersey, a 1977 Supreme Court uh, decision. And there, there was a challenge by a bondholder of Port Authority bonds to uh, New York and New Jersey statutes that had repealed a statutory covenant in those bonds that was made by those two states. And what the statutory covenant had done is restricted the ability of the uh, Port Authority to subsidize to subsidize rail passenger transportation from revenues of the authority, which were dedicated to the repayment of the bonds. The majority of the Supreme Court held that, the first, the Contracts Clause does not prohibit the states from repealing or amending even its own contracts, particularly if the state is exercising an essential attribute of its sovereignty. In particular, the state cannot surrender and must reserve its police power. The majority said that the taxing and spending power in contrast could be limited by contract, specifically when the state is incurring a financial obligation. The dissenters, uh, uh, Justice Brennan White and Marshall, found that the purpose in this case of, of repealing the covenant uh, in order to promote rail transit was an exercise of police power and therefore was not restricted by the contracts clause. But even in the majority, there is a test as a balancing test, and that is, do the laws that impair the contract, are they reasonable and necessary to serve an important public purpose? Now the court says it's not gonna to defer to the legislature because it in, in, these sort of in these sort of cases because they would involve specifically the contracts of the state, and there might be a conflict, a conflict of interest, but they found, the majority found, that the repeal of the covenant was neither necessary nor reasonable. And what's interesting for my purpose is to see why they found it neither necessary nor reasonable. First of all, the court said, quote, it cannot be said that a total repeal of the covenant was essential and therefore less drastic modifications would have been effective and maybe not violated the contracts clause. So it's a question of degree. Right? So if you think about the state bankruptcy regime, it would be a question of degree in substance and in process whether uh, uh, the uh, compromise or the reduction in the debt of the state 
uh, was drastic or whether it was essential and also whether it was reasonable. In, in asking whether something was reasonable, whether the repeal was reasonable, the court asked whether the conditions that gave rise to the repeal were foreseen or unforeseen. And they said at the time of the covenant, it was quite clear that there would be a need for uh, rail uh, passenger. In fact, it was discussed at that time of uh, subsidizing rail travel. And the covenant itself was intended to protect the reserves that were made for these bonds against that possibility. And therefore, uh, clearly, uh, uh, they, would, they would not allow uh, the state to later impair the contract, impair the covenants. Well, there's an interesting analog when it comes to unforeseeability in commercial law, and I'm primarily a commercial lawyer, not an expert in uh, public finance, and that is the excuse doctrines of impracticability and frustration in contracts, which also hinge on the lack of foreseeability. The commercial code speaks in awkward terms uh, about the occurrence of an event, the non-occurrence of which was a basic assumption of the contract, and you might say that a simple sort of approach is perhaps suggested by the court's opinion in the, uh, uh, in the Port Authority case. Uh, um, okay, the second case is the Fetut Iron and Steel versus City of Asbury Park case in 1942. It was an earlier case uh, that was cited approvingly in the, in the later U.S. Trust case that I mentioned, but it's also important because of the state statute in question. New Jersey had passed a statute in the early 1930s to authorize the state control over insolvent municipalities, and the statute allowed a plan for the adjustment of the claims of creditors against an insolvent municipality that would be made binding on all creditors if it received 85% of the uh, consent of the it consent of 85% of the creditors if it was consented to by the municipality and also by the relevant state commission. Um, and uh, the court would then review, the state court would then review the plan before authorizing it to make sure that it was in, quote, the best interests of the creditors. Then it would be binding against the non-consenting creditors. The bondholders challenged the statute under the contracts clause, but the uh, Supreme Court upheld the statute. Important to the court was the fact that it was scrutinized and authorized by the state court. Thank you. And that would be probably the case, or should be the case, with respect to a state bankruptcy statute of the type that I'm thinking of. The second important point is that the Supreme Court said that although the creditors had substantive rights against the municipality, the value, the practical value of an unsecured claim against a city is inseparable from its reliance upon the effectiveness of the city's taxing power. So remember I said earlier that raising taxes doesn't mean that you'll get more revenue, and the court recognized that in, in the case. They say, in fact, the quote, the experience of the two modern periods of municipal defaults after the depressions of uh, 1873 and 93 show that the right to enforce claims against a city through mandamus is an empty right to litigate. And therefore, given that the practical value of the claims were low, what the creditors were getting as a result of the plan did not really impair the value of their rights. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, let me move on to the faith and credit idea. And I'm out of time. But give me just two more minutes, if I could, just to introduce it. Um, so uh, states uh, pledge their faith and credit to the repayment of the principal and interest in their obligations. And although it's less explicit than the contracts clause jurisprudence, there's also similarly a balancing that goes on between the importance of the city's commitment and the idea that the state uh, should not surrender by contract its sovereign and particularly its police power. And one of the leading cases, of course, at the state court level is the Flushing National Bank versus Municipal Assistance Corporation for the City of New York case in 1976 that came out of the financial troubles of the uh, City of New York. And the state there, as part of its uh, response to it, uh, passed legislation to impose a three-year moratorium on the enforcement of debts. The majority in the court said that there is a constitutional requirement in the state constitution that obliges the city to pay and to use its good faith to levy taxes in order to produce funds to make the payments when due. Now, they, they looked at it and they thought that the exercise of, uh, sorry, the, imposi the imposition of the moratorium, 
was uh, inconsistent with their understanding of good faith, but the dissent uh, disagreed. So the question is, uh, if you combine it with the observation of the importance of the lack of foreseeability in, the, in some of the uh, uh, contracts clause jurisprudence, the question is whether it also goes to what the court might find as being in good faith or not when it comes to uh, a state restructuring regime that alters the, um, uh, uh, the principle or the interest or, or extends the maturity of, of uh, some obligation. Okay, well I'll stop there, uh, but in sum, the contracts clause and the faith and credit pledge and state con constitutions I think are an obstacle, but I think there is a row that can be, or an avenue that can be uh, followed for states to provide for their own restructuring regime. Uh, um, especially ones dealing with catastrophic and unforeseen circumstances. Thank you. Thanks, George and Adam and Marcus. Um, I want to save time for questions and discussion from the audience, but let me start the conversation by um, challenging or at least prodding my panelists a little bit more on one dimension. Uh, when we first, when Peter Conte Brown first put the panel together, we thought we had a problem because this was going to be a panel on whether bankruptcy laws should, bankruptcy proceedings should be available to states, and none of our panelists thought that they should be. Um, but as, as the discussion indicates, uh, particularly George's last points, um, we may have, that may be the consequence of framing the question a little too broadly. That is, if you think of bankruptcy as an either or thing, as a binary choice, should bankruptcy be available to states, should it not be available? Well, then I think our three panelists and myself too would come down on the side that it shouldn't be available. But in fact, bankruptcy is often better thought of as a matter of degree rather than an either or choice. I mean, this is a standard lawyer's move, a bi turning a binary choice into a spectrum. But think about the spectrum of possible bankruptcy procedures where on one end we have something like chapter 11, let's say, as we've all come to know and love it or know and hate it. But on the other end, well, what is the other end? What would be a world with no bankruptcy procedures, no restrictions on creditors' remedies? A, word, a world where every contract and every tort and every civil obligation was fully enforceable against states? So this, as a thought experiment, suppose we've done away with sovereign immunity. And a world where the standard remedy was not a court working out some plan where the state would raise taxes to pay for the judgment, but just a standard writ of execution. The seller can foreclose on the Chevy Impala police car or maybe on the state capitol building. As long as there are assets, creditors can keep suing the state and foreclosing on the assets that are left. And if the state doesn't have enough assets to pay everybody, well, the ones that come late to the table don't get anything, triggering the usual race to the courthouse, or I should say race to where the courthouse used to be before it was foreclosed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think anybody is advocating that we go to that extreme end of the spectrum with really no bankruptcy or no restrict, no bankruptcy-esque restrictions, to borrow another wonderful term from Adam's slide, um, no restrictions on creditors' remedies, uh, might be a good deterrent against states from getting into that position. So that I'm not saying the argument couldn't be made, but it's not an argument that's on the table now. Instead, it's more a situation where everybody likes some restrictions on creditors' remedies, some insulation of states from the race to the courthouse scenario that I just described which means that the devil really is in the details. Which restrictions are we in favor of and which aren't we? For instance, just to mention one possibility, you could have a bankruptcy proceeding that included most of what we know in Chapter 11, but did not include discharge of debts. The state could not get out of its contracts by going through this procedure, but have to propose the equivalent of a reorganization. Um, that starts sounding a little bit like what financial control boards do with municipalities or what receiverships do in other contexts. And as Adam pointed out, what that means is these start sounding a lot like bankruptcy under another name. You have to come up with, answer the same questions about what are the procedures, what are the priorities, who, who covers the expenses of the bankruptcy proceeding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let me pose the question to each of the three panelists before we open it for general question and answer. Um, if you're writing on a clean slate, or for George, if you were advising a state to decide what plan to opt into, which restrictions would you keep, or is there a particular restriction you'd keep, or a particular restriction that you want to get rid of? That is, let's take the discussion down to that level of detail, at least for a few minutes. Who do you want to go in the order? Sure. sure. Um, 
Well, I mentioned the, uh, the statute that was in the Fay 2, right, which was basically simply like a, collective act, like a collective action clause in a bond that says that when 85% of, of, of the holders uh, approve of a compromise, approve of a plan, then it's binding on the rest. Uh, and in addition to that, it had also the oversight of a court because, uh, 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 as well. And I think because I, I agree with the, uh, with the other panelists that uh, uh, I don't think that bankruptcy, however envisaged, uh, is a way of correcting for governance issues or economic uh, uh, distress, uh, as, as the term goes. I think all it is is a resetting mechanism. And the resetting mechanism is fundamentally a contractual, like a contractual term. And if you only had one set of creditors and they were just bondholders, you could just put that in the bonds themselves. But if you, but if you have multiple and diverse uh, creditors, then you may need to do that. It's essentially contractual, but you may need, may need to do that uh, by statute. And I think that's the extent of what uh, I would have in mind. I should mention that, of course, if you, if you pass a statute like that, with respect to all debt that follows, uh, it incorporates it as a term of the contract, so you don't really have any con constitutional issues at that point. It's implied, and this is where the foreseeability, I think, comes in, because uh, what's implied with respect to something that is unforeseen, well, that gives you a little bit of a blank slate to sort of play some, some games with the uh, impairment. So, when we, you know, what bankruptcy does is it, restructures one side of the balance sheet. And it restructures the right side of the balance sheet. It is not touching the left side. And I think that it's important to recognize what's different about a state from a firm in terms of the left side of the balance sheet. A firm usually is not able to increase its assets, you know, j just by fiat. That, um, and I feel that there's some kind of Chrysler joke lurking there. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, in, a fir, a fir, I mean, typically, a firm has done everything it can to maximize its, its, its income before it, uh, before, it, uh, before it ends up in bankruptcy. States, though, have, you know, do have ability to play with that left side of the balance sheet. Now, George rightly says, you know, you can get to a point where you start raising taxes and you actually get less revenue, but that's, that's just our Laffer curve, where, where, which says that at some point, you know, you keep raising taxes too high and you get, you get flight from the jurisdiction or people just not paying taxes. But we, we don't, and we don't know exactly where that point is, but I, I, I don't think we've seen any evidence that any U.S. jurisdiction is, any, is, is approaching that point. So I would start with this. You know, a, a, major a, a major principle in bankruptcy law is that the, re uh, that the restructuring has to be done in good faith. And I would, say, I, would, I would say that it's simply not good faith for a state to try and do a restructuring without first maximizing its revenue source, the sources. Now, you know, there, there's an evidentiary question, how, do, how does the state show that? But let's just say that a state that, that we have some 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 way of uh, satisfying that as an evidentiary matter. Okay, we could imagine then a, a catastrophic scenario where a state has you know hit the top of the Laffer curve, can't get any more revenue. At that point, then we have to turn back to the uh, to the right hand side of the balance sheet and figure out what expenses need to be cut. And that's a priority system, uh, the, the plain and simple. And I would say for states. That priority system, we really want to ideally uh, leave that up to states. I mean, those are distributional uh, questions, and they should be subject to the maximum possible political control. And doing it on the state level, you know, uh, I grew up in Illinois, and I'd much rather have uh, the, you know, the voters of Illinois making those decisions than I would want um, representatives elected from, I don't know, Arkansas and Alabama. Uh, that being said, one could imagine a sort of an, an, inter, an intermediate scenario. So George sort of painted out, have states do it alone. Uh, you know, states design their own system. Another way would be doing the federal government. There might be an alternative, an intermediate scenario, which is interstate compact, whereby a bunch of states could, uh, uh, could agree to opt, that they will opt into a system in which they contract with each other for, uh, for some kind of political control. If, uh, so imagine this. Um, California enters a deal with 10 other states and says if, you know, if we don't meet the following budget performance thresholds, then 
budgetary control is essentially transferred to, I don't know, um, some, uh, uh, an oversight panel that's composed of randomly selected governors from five of those other states in the compact. And California doesn't know if that's gonna be Sarah Palin or Mario Cuomo. Um, and you know, maybe that creates an incentive for them to behave well because they don't want, they don't want the risk averse. Yeah, so there, there may be an intermediate thing, but uh, ultimately I mean, there would still be a state opting into it. And I think that that's the most important thing is that one uh, is, is, keeping the, is trying to maximize the political control over the process, recognizing that the, that the distribution decisions are political and therefore making them subject to democratic controls. So if the question is whether we should have some kind of bankruptcy-like procedure, very broadly defined, sounds like we've got two votes yes. I think in, it's you end up with one inevitably if, if you have a problem. Mark in three settings for sole proprietorships, partnerships, and then very wealthy individuals who need to shield um, assets in order to be able to take risks uh, with uh, uh, investments. And so in other words, I see bankruptcy as an asset partition. Um, and we have other asset partitions for other kinds of, of things. And even the states themselves have an asset partition. Corporations have an asset partition in the sense that they have limited liability. States have their own form of asset partition, which I thought George was gonna mention when he was talking about constitutional impediments, but he didn't. And that's uh, sovereign immunity. States can't be sued unless they agree to be sued. Uh, and so uh, sovereign immunity operates as an asset partition for the state. That's why you don't see creditors driving down the street waving from a police cruiser, right? Because <laughs> they, can't, they can't go and repossess one. Um, uh, but I think Dick's question about a bankruptcy-like uh, solution, it, I, I, I'm not sure where I, whether I'm a yes or no on this, because um, your spectrum of bankruptcy, I think you're right to think of bankruptcy solutions as a spectrum. They can go from what we think of as a traditional bankruptcy um, um, process that we see happening every day in our federal court system all the way to ad hoc, one-off um, uh, processes like Chrysler. I mean, you know I'm gonna keep mentioning Chrysler because it, because it doesn't resemble a traditional bankruptcy. It doesn't uh, have a relationship to the rule of law that we think of in uh, a traditional bankruptcy. So Adam is right in the sense that what makes bankruptcy useful is that we put a structure in place before relationships exist, and that structure tells people what the rules are gonna be if things go bad, and then when things go bad, we can uh, resort to that process. What we're gonna have in this situation is at the other end of the spectrum, which is we already know that things are possibly gonna go bad. George is saying we're not talking about today, but maybe talk about a situation where things get worse. If things do get worse, we're gonna put in place a structure where we know who the winners and losers are gonna be ex ante. In other words, we don't have a Rawlsian veil of ignorance. And if we know that, then we know that the process that we're gonna put in place is gonna be su uh, the subject of political strife and maneuvering, and we know that the outcome is gonna be uh, illegitimate or potentially uh, uh, illegitimate because of that political uh, maneuvering. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not okay with any form of bankruptcy in, in almost any setting, but we don't have an opportunity to impose an ex-ante bankruptcy process. We know that if we come up with any kind of bankruptcy-like process, it's going to be an ex-post ad hoc process, and I'm definitely against uh, one that tries to paint it as legitimate by calling it a bankruptcy. All we know, is, uh, we know that it's gonna be redistributionist in some sense. If I could add something uh, just briefly. I, I agree, the ad hoc is, is, is a concern. I think, I think it's helpful to think of bankruptcy as it is for individuals in the insurance terms. Uh, and let me frame it in the following way. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that could happen in my life that, that would increase uh, the costs and would put financial burdens. One thing that I could do is have a rainy day fund, uh, a contingency fund to get ready for it, and indeed, states do that, right? They, they California apparently, you know, had, had a, or I don't know if they still have, a rainy day fund, right? Where they put some money aside. We rated uh, that already. Yeah. 
um, so politically that's diff difficult because of course uh, I want to live a good life uh, along the way and so every once in a while I may not really fulfill my obligation or, or, the, or the needed uh, contributions to the rainy day fund. I think putting insurance is an alternative to that, right? And that is buying insurance is an alternative to a rainy day fund in the sense that I'll pay my premium every year and I'll have the fund available from the third party. And that's the way I would sort of see uh, this, uh, the state bankruptcy regime or the state restructuring regime. And that is it will reset it in the event of some extraordinary and unforeseen contingency. And it is an alternative and perhaps a more politically effective alternative to an insurance, uh, to a rainy day fund because what it does is that it obliges the state to pay a little bit more for its debt every year. It's like buying extra insurance. I should also say that lest we think that a state can self-insure because it's so big, of course, if you think that the type of contingency is one that's idiosyncratic, it's going to affect the state, it's unforeseen, an insurer or the market can uh, certainly uh, uh, spread the risk uh, across different jurisdictions. So I just want to respond really quickly to that. So what we have, is, when you think of uh, bankruptcy, and particularly consumer bankruptcy as an insurance scheme, what you're saying is you want an insurance scheme where you don't have to pay the premiums. Right? You're essentially creating an insurance scheme where the insured neither uh, save or, uh, nor pay. And that's no, 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 you would do it because you would provide for the bankruptcy, uh, the insurance, and then you'd have to pay it in terms of a higher cost of debt. As, Your long, interest as, set up in if, if, as long as it's set up in advance. That's not what we have with consumer bankruptcy. No. Peter, do we have time for questions? Yes, we absolutely do. And in fact, I was going to insert myself at the beginning uh, on behalf of uh, David Skeel, who's lurking right now. He's doing a live stream of the, uh, the conference. And so he had a question that I just wanted to put forward. This is actually for George from David. Um, and the question is, with love, right, exactly. Um, the question is thinking about a, a restructuring regime for states, uh, a question about the dynamics of state decision making. Uh, in particular, when, uh, when corporations are engaging in a, in a menu approach to bankruptcy, they're thinking about shareholder interests. Right? So who are the state's shareholders? Are the states thinking about markets and how they'll, uh, they'll present themselves to the markets as a viable investment opportunity going forward? Or are they going to be thinking about their employees, their citizens, et cetera? I mean, who is the shareholder for the states? Uh, I don't have a, an easy answer other than to say it would be the same as, as many other decisions that states make, right? They have to take into account all constituencies. But the nice thing is that if they think about it as buying insurance on behalf of their citizens, on behalf of their taxpayers, they now know what the price is. The market will tell them how much it costs, and then they have to make a decision the way they decide how many buses to buy, or, you know, and that is way the benefit against the cost, but they've got a market tax, right? And that should be something that helps them be sovereign, to make decisions as sovereign. Judge Williams. Yeah, this is a question largely for Professor Triantis, but, but Adam might have something to say on it, Marcus as well. Um, I thought your discussion of U.S. Trust and Asbury Park was fascinating, and I have a hypothetical for you. Suppose you have a state that has, um, has made non-trivial cuts in expenditures. Uh, and, it, and, and then there's a piece of legislation under which it is going to reduce its payments on bonds, either by some extension or re some restructuring haircut. Uh, and a similar provision with respect even to pensions already accumulated by state employees. And uh, the state employees, understandably, and the bondholders sue, I assume, in state court because of the 11th Amendment. And the state court, let's forget about what it says. It says something. And then it goes to the US Supreme Court. How does the Supreme Court rule on that? Well, to, to be. To be let me raise two specific parts of it. Does the Supreme Court even consider a mandate to the state to raise taxes? And if it does, does it go into where we are on the Laffer curve and all that? And second, does the Supreme Court consider, or order the state court to consider, trade-offs as between the haircut imposed on the 
bondholders and the haircut imposed on the uh, public employees. Well, it's never a good thing when a judge says your argument is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I, and I, um, but uh, let's take the state first. Uh, the, um, the case that I mentioned, the uh, flushing, um, uh, the flushing case in New York was very interesting, right? Because the court, even though the court found that the uh, moratorium violated the uh, faith and credit provision of the state constitution, they said at the end, but we're not going to give you a remedy. You go back to the legislature and work this out. In fact, I've got a quote here. They said, the plaintiffs, quote, are not entitled immediately to extraordinary or any particular judicial measures that unnecessarily disrupt the city's delicate financial and economic balance. Okay, so they say, well, go back to the uh, uh, state and work this out because this is very delicate and they know better how to balance all this. So they didn't. They, they decided not to grant a mandamus or Right, or what without a remedy. With, right without a remedy, yeah. And I thought, I thought that's very interesting. Now, of course, we know what would happen in that case. There would be some compromise between the two, and they, there would be a, a, a renegotiation, which again tells you that states can do a lot on their own, uh, even uh, even these circumstances. With respect to the um, uh, with respect to the uh, contracts clause. Um, so it's not clear from U.S. Trust how much the court is going to scrutinize these things. It's true that the way the jurisprudence has evolved, contracts clause cases in, in involving state contracts, uh, that, the, uh, that the federal courts will not defer, right? So they will look at it and they will look to see whether it's uh, reasonable and essential and, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the purpose. Uh, for the appropriate purpose, and in my mind, uh, what I detected from a closer reading is that the things that they that they that they would like to see is some layers of investigation. So not just the state making a decision. I think it was important. I said to them that there was a state court that looked into it that that determined whether it was in the best interests of the creditors. Uh, I think that was significant, and also this, the fact that it was uh, not foreseeable, but beyond that, I, I don't have a good sense. I, I don't think the case law is clear as to what extent they would investigate all these alternatives. So, so what, what I found interesting about your exploration of the, um, of the constitutional limitations is that bondholders, for some reason, never sue under the bankruptcy clause of Article 1, Section 8, because there's a much older line of cases um, starting with, uh, or, or ending actually with uh, Sturgis versus Crown and Shield back in 1827, where the Supreme Court says, you know, states have complete freedom to, to enact um, uh, insolvency law and, uh, and establish the relations between debtors and creditors, but they don't have uh, complete freedom to enact bankruptcy laws, right? That's reserved for Congress under Article One, Section 8. And so if this thing starts to look like um, a bankruptcy uh, statute or a bankruptcy amendment to a state constitution, I would think that that would violate the bankruptcy clause of Article 1, Section 8, and that bondholders ought to be suing under under that provision in a, in a case like dormant, uh, a dormant right, power. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. under, uh, yeah. so, so for example, in your flushing case, um, the, that, uh, that, that would strike me as violative of Article 1, Section 8. And that's what I think the court should do in that case. Uh, Marcus, but w would any impairment of a creditor's claim no. be, f qualify, uh, uh, may turn something into, ba in, into bankruptcy? No, no, one, one that was sweeping, right? One where the, the state said, uh, look, we're going, to, we're going to cause all of the creditors here to take a haircut. And we're going to, we're going to uh, basically treat this like a bankruptcy um, proceeding. That, that's that's or, how I would like a bankruptcy esque proceeding. A bankruptcy esque proceeding, right? So it's the it's the collective nature rather than the right uh, the, 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 the case by case treatment. on a case by case uh, situation. I think then we're in a uh, uh, there we're in a sovereign immunity um, situation. But when you when you have a, a sweeping impairment of classes of claims. Then I think you're enacting a bankruptcy law, and I think that that violates Article One, Section Eight. Thank you. Thank you. Which, which actually 
is exactly what I wanted to ask is this sovereign immunity, which I've been, I've had in the back of my head for a while, and I'm probably just really stupid here, but maybe someone can help me out. Um, I'm, in most state geo obligations issued under that state law, and um, do they include a waiver of sovereign immunity generally? And if not, you know, can't the state just refuse to hear the case? I mean, if, if what happens in terms of just even getting to having a court case in the first place, right, if there's a default? So this is actually something uh, David Skeel and I uh, were talking about at the, the last conference that we were at together. David, David came up with the idea of you know, what if states waive their sovereign immunity ex ante? So they, they haven't done that? Uh, it's not, not. They do. They do. I mean, yeah, when they incur the obligation, they clearly do. Yeah. There's a commercial, sorry, there's a commercial exception. So, so the sovereign immunity is waived. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's how the bonds are priced. So, so, so in terms of the, the litigation, it doesn't really come into play. Well, well, it comes into it comes into play as to what the 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 recourse is with respect to the bonds. I mean, you can't walk away with a, a police cruiser or um, the the keys to the state capitol building. You can get a, but you can get a judgment. Right. And then enforcing judgments that's that's easy. Then there's no sort of. Sovereign just gets, I'm, I'm immune, so you can't enforce your judgment. Well, Clay Gillette's a, a lot, uh, at least than <laughs> I, compared to me, he, he's a lot better informed. But the idea is that you would get, a, you could get a mandamus remedy, but uh, as Clay was telling me earlier, it's against an official of the state, uh, a state official who could always resign or. Be an order away. said to the but state treasurer saying, write a check. That's what happened during the Depression era. Um, a mandamus would be issued against a particular official. The mandamus was to collect taxes. The official would resign, would making the mandamus worthless. <laughs> the bondholder would then have to go back to court to get a new writ of mandamus against the new official, who could then. <laughs> <laughs> Michael has written about this. This is this was also cited by the, the Supreme Court in Fee too, when they say it's an yeah, empty this right. Is why I said it was an empty right. It's practical. They say, you know, they have that problem. Um, so that's a nice segue into the, the question and observation I want to make, because I really like George's notion of, of a market solution. Um, but um, so first, the comment. Uh, both of which, go, my, both my comment and my question go to not the propriety of the market solution, but the practicality of it. So of course, when Chapter 9 is written, the first, uh, the only restriction that Congress places on the states, what states can do, is to reverse the holding in FI2. They, the only explicit restriction, they say states can do it, you know, we're not interfering with states at all, except no composition of debts can be created by a state. Now, again, they can, they can undo that, so I'm not suggesting that your suggestion is, is a bad idea. It's, I'm, I'm just wondering aloud what motivated them to do that that might suggest as a practical matter um, at, at least some of the market-based selections that would allow states to distinguish themselves by creating bankruptcy-like regimes um, would, in fact, uh, be, uh, be politically feasible. Secondly, I, I, I'm, I like markets. Um, so I like Jonathan's suggestion and George's follow up on it, but this is kind of a back end way to ask the question I wanted to ask Jonathan, which was <laughs> given, the, given the inability, I think there's an inability, sure of any constitutional uh, amendment, uh, to credibly commit the federal government against bailouts. That being the case, I take it some states are going to be more, have a greater capability of obtaining federal bailouts than others. California might get bailed out before West Virginia, even if West Virginia had deeper internal problems simply because the potential contagion effects of a West Virginian default would be fewer than the contagion effects of a California default. So there might be a greater claim by California to obtain a federal bailout. That seems to me to have two consequences for your market-based solution. First of all, the mere existence of the possibility of a federal bailout, I think, undermines the, the market-based solution. In other words, you just can't, you, you just, it seems to me you can't have this clear market-only solution 
as long as there is the possibility of the implicit federal guarantee. Secondly, I wonder what the disparate capacity of the different states to obtain a federal bailout means for your market solution. That is, would California be more likely to forego an internal solution because it knows it can rely on a, an implicit federal bailout more readily than, say, North Dakota. So you'd have sort of this binary, I, I, I hate to do the binary thing because Dick quite appropriately told us not to do that. Um, but you could, you could see a variety of states saying we're less l likely to obtain a federal bailout, therefore using market-based solutions, but then other states saying we're more likely to obtain a federal bailout, therefore shying away from market-based solutions, but still get the benefit of the market rate, of, of a good market rate, because they have access to the federal bailout more readily. And I wonder, in the light of that, whether the m we're really talking about market-based solutions at all. Yeah. Um, should should I, I, I comment on, on it briefly? Uh, uh, you're right. I mean, there's no question that uh, the presence of state restructuring will reduce the chance of the bailout because, of course, the federal government will say, hey, just restructure your debt. You don't need to. But uh, what you point out, which I hadn't thought of, is that there will be a discrepancy. And therefore, the states, let's say, who are be more likely to get, to get favorable treatment by the federal may say, we don't need a restructuring, and therefore they just won't uh, enact it. I think the only thing that I can say in response is that'll be quite visible, right? And it may raise some question by, the, by someone in Congress saying, look, all the other, other states have restructuring and California doesn't. What's going on here may put pressure on them to enact something, but I think it, it'll continue to be a problem. And on the uh, uh, FETUT, yeah, Chapter 9 uh, amendment reversed FETUT, but just for municipalities, of course, and therefore it would take an, uh, legislation by Congress in order to say FETUT doesn't apply uh, to states. I just raised it as, as a way of asking So what I re what my recollection is there already was a chapter nine, right, at the time of Fate Two, and so um, yes. wasn't there, and yes. and therefore it it kind of un undermined the integrity or the purpose of of the ch of the chapter. Maybe it was threatening or something like that, which it may be different in this case because there is no federal state bankruptcy. That's just speculation. So th thinking about the, this as an insurance perspective, you know, I, I wonder if we there's also might be a, an adverse selection problem that that, that can occur here if you don't make it mandatory for, for all the states to do this. And then if you're making this an insurance regime mandatory for all the states, would it be better to have this done through you know, a formal insurance system to say you know, where they're, you know, the way we do it with, with uh, pension guarantees or FDIC insurance? And you know, they, I, I guess it kind of comes down to the question of the pricing, right? That do we think that, um, if we had a formal federal insurance regime, would the federal government put the premiums at the right levels, or do we have more confidence that you know that a market mechanism like you described would do it, would, would it get it correct? At? So just let me ask you about the adverse selection. So adverse selection, you need some information asymmetry, right? So what is the information that the state has that the market doesn't have in order to produce the adverse selection? I need to think about that. Uh, that, you know, that I'm not sure, but um, certainly uh, you, you at least have the problem that the states that are most likely to end up in, in needing Chapter 11 and uh, need, needing some kind of bankruptcy relief are going to be the ones that are going to, the only reason that they're going to opt in is that they think they're getting a better deal. The, that the state, uh, I don't know what that, uh, that information is, but the, the state will think that it has, that it's getting a good, a good deal by doing this. Right. And that makes me worry that there is some kind of uh, information right. asymmetry. Hi. Yeah, I'm a finance professor, okay? I know very little about the law, which is why I'm here. But I think this debate that you ha guys are having is missing a critical component, okay? It's called incentives. Now, liking state bankruptcy to corporate bankruptcy is just a complete mistake, okay? Because a corporate bankruptcy is, a, is, is essentially a change of control, okay? Control goes from equity holders to debt holders, okay? That doesn't happen with states. Nobody loses. So comparing this to a corporate bankruptcy is just completely wrong. The way you want to compare it is to personal bankruptcy, right? Where you don't, you don't, the, when, when, a per, when a person declares bankruptcy, they, they don't lose control of themselves. They don't, they're not enslaved. In the same way, 
that a state is not enslaved. So the idea of insurance, that's just a ruse because the people on the other, somebody has to hold the other side of that insurance contract. That's basically a bondholder. So we're back to bondholders. So that's not, also not going to solve the problem. So the problem essentially is, if you allow the states to renege on their debt, you remove all incentive from the state to ever pay the debt back, because they can always walk away at any point in time. So now, my understanding of the law based on this discussion is, but really, the states can do that, right? The contract clause of the Constitution is not going to be enforced on the states, right? So they can essentially walk away on their debt. So I guess my question to you is, as a finance professor, if I'm gonna sit there and look at the, the, the value of the debt and figure out that eventually, if the states are under so much debt, they're just gonna walk away, who do you think will benefit versus, you know, what, what bondholders are going to be able to get some, do some, some money on their dollars and what bondholders are not gonna be able to get in, in a court of law some repayment of their debt. Peter tells me we're almost due for lunch, so let me put the question on hold, get the one last question, and then the, let the panelists respond to whatever they like. Thank you. Uh, if, if we step back to the title of the conference, uh, When States Go Broke, it seems to me that there are political issues that override everything else, and that I'm from Cleveland, I don't always admit it. The first, the first city that went bankrupt uh, preceding New York. Uh, and that the responses to those situations have been entirely political. If you look at California and the situation we're in, you find that both parties during good times have spent everything that was coming in in good times and then a bit uh, with the idea that a rising tide raises all ships, and no real recognition that there are diurnal rhythms. Third, which by the way, I, I've done a good bit of work in Nebraska, and states like Nebraska, that couldn't happen there because of the political climate, not because of any other controls. Third, the pizza analogy, which I loved, uh, it is also a political reality that people want more and more and more services at a very high level and are now being told and believing that it's immoral to ask that particular person who's asking for the services to pay for any portion of them. Given those overriding political dimensions to the problem, to what extent is looking at technicalities of economic solutions or technicalities of bankruptcy and legalistic solutions uh, simply picking who wants to choose which deck chairs to rearrange. So I think the questions are, are really related um, because the, the incentive uh, for states to not renege on their, uh, their obligations is because they need to be able to raise capital in the future and can't do so if they have a bad credit rating, right? If they if they renege on um, their obligations, and that also um, is related to the idea of um, of putting political pressure on the constituents, uh, the cons various constituencies within the states, to to arrange their political affairs in a way that they can meet their obligations. I just want to clarify about the insurance. Uh, uh, I wouldn't call it insurance if it was just a call on a bunch of money, right? I mean, that's not really insurance. There has to be an insured event. And the question is, what is the insured event? And that's where I think the role of the court is important. Remember, I'm saying this is insurance for some extraordinary unforeseen event. And, it, and in, a, in an insurance contract, usually it's specified pretty clearly what something is. But in this sort of case, there's nothing inconsistent with, with, with insurance to say that we will describe it in terms of a standard rather than a rule to use that uh, contrast from uh, legal scholarship. So this will be that this adjustment will occur if a court finds it's in the best interest of the creditors and if the court finds that this sort of contingency, an extraordinary catastrophe, however you want to put it, it has occurred. And that will solve, that will address at least, it won't solve, but it will solve the moral hazard problem to the extent that it's unforeseen, to the extent that it is catastrophic in the way that David framed it to begin with, 
I think that, that addresses the moral hazard problem. It's not like any time you want, you can get your debt reduced. That's not, that's not insurance in my book. Well, thank you, all of you. Thanks to the panelists. I believe lunch is in the faculty lounge where breakfast was this morning, and we'll schedule to be back here at 1.15 for the next panel. Great. And now I